NAQT, National Academic Quiz Tournaments. NAQT welcomes you to this recorded webinar, An Introduction to Online Quiz Bowl Tournaments for Players and Coaches. This recording frequently references NAQT's online tournament guide, which is available on our website. Follow along at naqt.com slash online. Additionally, a companion recorded webinar aimed at people who are organizing or directing online tournaments is also available. Now here's NAQT's Chief Technical Officer, Robert Hensel. All right. Uh... Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you to National Academic Quiz Tournament's webinar on what to expect at an online quiz bowl tournament as a coach or a player. Uh, and just to be clear, I'm using tournament in a very inclusive sense here to mean any actual competition that's not a practice. Uh, duels, quads, weekly meets, conference meets, um, as well as the sort of large scale events with lots and lots of teams and lots and lots of games on the same day. So if it's not a practice, it's a tournament for the purpose of this webinar. Uh, I will be the host of this afternoon's webinar. My name is Robert Hensel, and I am NAQT's Chief Technical Officer. In that role, I've worked closely uh, with my colleagues at NAQT and with other groups in the Quiz Bowl world to develop our online tournament guide. Uh, I've also run seven real online tournaments this competition year and a large number of experimental games that were designed solely to test various uh, ideas about what might be the right way to do things. This is the second of two webinars that NAQT is doing this December about online quiz bowl. The target audience of this one is coaches and players. The first, which was last Thursday, December 10th, uh, focused on the needs of tournament directors and staffers. Uh, both webinars will be edited and made available for download and later viewing uh, with links on the NAQT website. So my general plan for this webinar is to spend about 40 minutes going over the most important aspects of NAQT's online tournament guide. Uh, and then I will answer questions for the final 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so why would you wanna watch this webinar rather than just calling up the guide and reading it at your own leisure? Uh, certainly we didn't hold anything back uh, when we wrote the guide. Everything that we know or think that we know is in there somewhere. Uh, but we've been told that it is uh, long and detailed and perhaps a bit of a chore to read. So uh, in response to that, the point of this webinar is to try to hit the most important points and to do it while explaining a bit of NAQT's thought process so that it uh, maybe makes a bit more sense why, thing, why we recommend what we do. Uh, and I will also do a little bit of screen sharing to show some of the tools and technologies that we recommend in action, which will maybe uh, make their use a bit more immediate and intuitive. Uh, that said, I'm going to gloss over some of the details. So if my explanations don't seem complete, uh, look at the guide. If you look there and you still have questions, once again, uh, email us to ask. We here at NAQT, we have uh, every personal and professional reason to want to see online tournaments flourish this year. Uh, and that means making coaches uh, aware of what they need to do to prepare their teams for it and making players comfortable uh, and comfortable with online formats and able to show up knowing what to expect so you can have the most amount of fun and learn the most while doing it. Before really digging in, uh, I should emphasize that NAQT chose to call its online tournament guide a guide for a good reason. Basically, nothing in that guide is an absolute requirement to run an online tournament or even an absolute requirement to run a good online tournament. There's viable alternatives for just about every choice. And uh, some hosts are gonna face different situations or uh, different sets of rules that they need to follow. And that's gonna result in them doing things differently. So uh, the main way that I'm gonna to talk today about how online tournaments will work is our recommendation. It's what we think is optimal, but you shouldn't assume that uh, well, you certainly shouldn't assume that every tournament is going to run this way. And you shouldn't assume that any host doing things differently is doing it wrong. Uh, clearly, you know, can engage with the host if you don't understand uh, how something is going to work or why it's being done. But on the whole, uh, I recommend adopting an attitude of being thankful that hosts are going to the trouble 
of learning new ways to do things and moving their tournaments online in the first place. And of course, uh, even after a couple of months, this is still new to all of us as a, as a way of organizing and thinking about Quiz Bowl. This webinar is my attempt to share, uh, to give you the advantage of the research and understanding that NAQT has done, but these recommendations might well change as we in the greater Quiz Bowl community try new things and invent new tools and just gather better data about how things are working. So I wanted to start out with uh, three sort of uh, vague observations, but that are taken together form the key principles that really underlay NAQT's recommendations for online tournaments. Uh, and I'm doing this because I think that sharing them also can uh, really lay the foundation for what coaches and players should think about as they try to answer their own questions about tournaments. Uh, and so uh, the first of those key principles is that online tournaments are going to take more time. Uh, this is something we've been able to measure pretty precisely uh, with online tournaments that are reading questions using our online question system. We know exactly when questions start and end and when games start and end. Uh, and we can say that playing a game on, uh, according to NEQT's online rules, which is 20 toss-up bonus cycles, the game takes 34 minutes of gameplay on average. And the start to start time, that is the time from when a player, when a team starts its game in round one to the time when it starts in round two or between any two consecutive rounds is about 44 minutes. Uh, and these are means, not medians. So the longest of the longer games are longer <laughs> than the shortest of the short games are shorter. Uh, so essentially there's a long tail out to the right. So what's the point of sharing these numbers? Uh, it's basically to drive home the fact that uh, an online tournament uh, can't give you the same amount of quiz bowl in the same amount of time as an in-person tournament. And a host is going to address that maybe by starting earlier or running later, or possibly by offering fewer games or uh, offering shorter games or possibly making even uh, even more impactful rules changes. And uh, I've had a lot of teams sort of express some dismay before they played their first online tournament saying that it, it seems like it was a, a shorter experience. And that's true, but I think also it's sadly uh, the way that it is and something that, that teams and coaches need to accept uh, that is going to be true for online events. Uh, on the plus side, uh, we certainly have done measurements of uh, how long games take as teams experience and staffers experience uh, increases. And those games are in fact uh, shorter, they run faster. So uh, certainly after a couple of tournaments, it would be reasonable to think that they're going to run faster and may be able to give you more games or take less total time to play. Uh, and finally, as a warning, if you're a coach or a player going to a tournament and you see that uh, rounds are scheduled to start every 30 minutes. Uh, I think, assuming the rules are something like NAQT standard rules, I think you'd be right to be suspicious of that and you should make general plans for what you're going to do if the tournament runs late. Uh, maybe everything will work out, the games will run that fast, but statistically it's unlikely. And that's something you should be looking for in the schedule. Make sure that the the host of the tournament you're going to has provided a realistic schedule. Uh, again, we'd say for a standard NAQT round, assuming that on average with inexperienced teams and inexperienced moderators that you're going to finish uh, average less than 45 minutes a game, probably not going to happen. And again, if you're playing a state format that has uh, more questions or inserts lightning rounds or uh, allows much more time for bonus questions, those timeframes are probably going to get uh, expanded as well. Uh, so the second of the key principles is the paramount importance of audio quality. Uh, at the start of the competition year, NAQT did a whole series of mock games using different technologies and different rules to try to figure out what worked best. At part of that was just asking players afterwards, hey, was that fun? Did anything about it put you on edge? Did it 
feel like real quiz bowl, real in-person quiz bowl. And overall, what we heard over and over again was that the biggest factor in how people enjoyed the game and how they perceived it as a, a learning experience, as a social experience, is the quality of the audio and the, and the network connection. So that, that's a fairly wide ranging term that encompasses a whole lot of decisions from the video conferencing platform used to your local, the hardware that's in every single player's house. But broadly, I mean, is this audio that uh, plays clearly and without compression artifacts and with no latency, so there's not, uh, there's not jumps or skips. Uh, basically, you have to be able to understand the questions and the responses, even when, as quiz bowl questions often are, they, uh, they consist of pretty complex structures or have lots of unfamiliar words. And so you might say, well, yes, that's obvious. You have to be able to hear the question. How else could it possibly work? But my real point is just the degree to which that this factor trumps uh, everything else that's involved. Uh, in our tests, we could have a, a lot go wrong or be cumbersome, but if the game had uh, clear audio, it was still very well received by the participants. So uh, this, uh, this fact, this result was what drove a lot of the other decisions that we made. And I'm gonna talk about those later in this webinar. But for now, I would say, as you approach your own events, uh, think about even things that can have small effects on your own network and audio quality. And those are probably worth uh, thinking about and addressing in advance that in total, they'll add up to a much better experience all around for Quiz Bowl. And we'll talk about some of those technical things later. Uh, and third is the, the importance of communication with everybody. And so obviously every tournament needs, needs good communication at all stages, but with an, with an in-person event, it's a lot easier to, uh, I think, fix imperfect communication. Everybody is there in one place. You can make a last minute announcement, sort of knowing that everyone is there and that they can hear it. If you need to find a team during the event, you just walk across the hall to the room they're supposed to be in and so on. Uh, probably my most vibrant memory of the first online tournament that I ran was how out of touch I felt with how the tournament was progressing and how I had difficulties doing things that were fundamentally communication-based that would have been very easy at an in-person event. Uh, it got to be the start time of the event, and I wasn't definitely sure that every team was there because I hadn't provided a, a check-in mechanism. Whereas at an in-person event, every coach had to come up to talk to me to pick up a schedule. Or uh, toward the end of the tournament, I had to distribute a playoff bracket. So great, I had emails for all the coaches. I emailed it out, but having done that, I didn't really know you know, is every coach paying attention? Will they pass this immediately on to the players? Will they pass it on eventually? Uh, do, they, do they know they should be checking email now? And uh, that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about, that it becomes a lot more important to think about and discuss and have agreements, uh, both from the TD to the coach and the coach to the players about how the information is going to be transmitted. Uh, so, uh, you can expect, as a player or a coach, you should think about the format of the term that you're going to and think about the points of the tournament when you might need to get information that wasn't able to be presented beforehand. Uh, for instance, okay, now we break for the playoffs. How do we get the playoff bracket? Or uh, there's going to be tiebreakers after this preliminary round robin. How will we be notified if we are in those? And think about those in advance and if the TD doesn't make clear uh, how that information will be communicated and when it will be communicated, then reach out and ask in advance. Uh, and maybe that's going to be, uh, there's a group chat channel for this. Maybe it's going to be, it's going to be posted on this web page. Maybe it'll be emailed, will be texted, uh, but whatever it is, make sure you know how you're going to get that information and then be ready to receive it at that time. So while I was doing the the host webinar on Thursday, I on the fly came up with a sort of meta point that I wanted to add after reviewing those three things. Uh, and I guess to review them, uh, 
online matches are going to take longer. Audio and network quality is pretty much the most important thing for making online quiz bowl work. And uh, you need to think in advance about how, how messages are going to be communicated that need to be communicated during the tournament. Communication is important. Uh, the, the fourth sort of meta point that I added is that from our experience, uh, a, just a little bit of hands-on exposure and practice to the things that go into an online tournament make an incredible difference. If you're a player, you shouldn't be using Zoom for the first time when you log in to start the first game of the tournament. Uh, it shouldn't be the first time that you log into a buzzin.live room. Uh, it shouldn't be the first time you're using your new webcam. Uh, all of those things, take the time, work with them in advance so you, uh, you know how they work and they're all configured correctly when you head into the tournament. Uh, if you're a coach, um, make sure that you have run an online practice with your team, hopefully simulating the game conditions of whatever tournament you're going to. Um, if you're signed up to staff the tournament, make sure you are familiar with what staffers are going to have to do, whether that's creating a Zoom meeting or using the NAQT online question system or using whatever scoring system they have. Uh, just make sure that you're prepared in advance. It doesn't take too long to get, uh, to get much more familiar with some of the basic tools. Uh, yes, it's tough to find time to do all these things, but it, uh, it is worth the investment. Uh, all right, so enough about overarching principles that hopefully are going to apply to the games that everybody listening is going to play, whether they're NAQT format or VHSL format or the Missouri State High School Activities Association format or wherever else you're from. Uh, those three things should apply, um, although their concrete implementation will differ from format to format. But so, so some definite details about how to expect online quiz bowl to work, at least at events that are being run by NQT's online tournament guide. So the first thing is that instead of a game room, right, the notion of a physical game room with tables and chairs and a buzzer system is replaced by a Zoom meeting that lasts the entire day. So instead of having you know, room 107 that teams would go to for their game, the tournament director will set up a schedule that says the Zoom meeting at this URL is going to be used for games throughout the day. As a, as a coach, you will see that your, uh, your A team, your varsity team is assigned to this particular meeting room, i.e. this URL for the first round, then they're assigned to a different URL for the second round. Moderators and scorekeepers will generally be assigned to a single Zoom meeting for the rest of the day. They'll be in that meeting the whole day and teams will come and go. So as a player, you would uh, come to the tournament, you'd get the schedule, you'd say, okay, in round one, I'm in this URL. And you just open that URL in, uh, in your browser that starts the Zoom client. You're in the meeting, you're there to play the game. You play the game. When the game is done, then you go back to the schedule and you see, where am I supposed to be for round two? And then you go there. That's the, the gist of how an online tournament is going to work. You move from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, playing games. Uh, and I guess I can, I can show you a sample schedule that I made for one of my recent tournaments here. That for the schedule at the top, you can see there's sort of basic information about who's coming. Then there are the rounds. One, two, three, four, five, six. Teams are labeled X and Y. We'll talk about what that means later. But then you would look to find your team. You look to the left. And this room here, that is actually a hyperlink to the Zoom meeting that is going to contain the game. Uh, also on here, note, well, in the interest of good communication, note that the tournament director has provided uh, links to the stats and the pre-tournament atrium meeting, the playoff bracket, times and contact information directly. Hopefully those are things that you'll also see on the schedule or other bits of pre-tournament communication that a tournament director sends out to you. So also as part of a game, uh, and this part replaces the actual buzzer system that is characteristic of Quiz Bowl, is a buzzin.live room. So buzzin.live is a separate website that uh, essentially acts as the buzzer. It gives every player a a button that they use to buzz in, and it tells the, the host of the room, the moderator, 
who buzzed in first. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the moderator will typically be reading a questions from some electronic source, but as coaches and players, that doesn't make uh, much of a difference to you. Uh, there are a few rules changes, but uh, by and large, uh, the same rules that are in effect for normal quiz bowl matches will be in effect for online quiz bowl matches. The rules that change are mostly about uh, how timing works and the answering of bonuses and how to deal with audio problems. Uh, we'll go over those in detail later. Uh, but uh, the game as a whole, once you get to the right room, it should proceed much like it does in person. The moderator will read the questions aloud. You will buzz in. You will answer by speaking. Uh, none of this is typed. This is all carried out uh, by speaking into the Zoom meeting. On bonuses, you'll consult, consult and give your answer by voice. So uh, very similar to a traditional in-person game. And it keeps as much of the feel of traditional in-person quiz bowl as is possible. Uh, one question that was asked uh, quite a lot is why Zoom? Uh, obviously, there's uh, many other video conferencing platforms out there that do the same or similar things. Uh, and honestly, the, the main reason that NAQD recommends Zoom is that in our experience, it has the best audio and network quality of all the ones that we tried. And so I don't want to say that Zoom is the best for everything. In fact, there are parts of Zoom that are uh, irritating, uh, particularly things that irritate me are dealing with users and licensing, the fact that it's not free, and um, also that it's, it's a lot trickier to write uh, bots or to automate behavior in uh, using Zoom, unlike with Discord, where it's relatively easy. And people have written some really impressive programs to help with the administration of a tournament. Uh, it's, uh, I think it is a real point of how strongly we believe in this point about audio and network quality that we are recommending Zoom. OK, here's one. Does each moderator need their own email or login for the NAQT question bank? Or could I, as the coach, set up a generic account for my moderators? Each moderator will need their own login for the NAQT online question site uh, because we need to, basically we need to differentiate them. We need to know uh, when somebody's accessing the site, we need to know sort of who they are and what game they're a part of. And we also need uh, some amount of accountability for who is being allowed in to view questions. Uh, however, making an account is quick and free. Are schools played in the same building or are they played at each individual school? And how do you deal with lag in the internet connection when questions are read? Um, so this, this varies. Most of the tournaments that I have directly uh, worked with that are online, the players are all playing from home. Um, but uh, there's no reason that players couldn't be all at their school or possibly some other uh, sort of building uh, if that was in line with whatever the local uh, school policies and health regulations are. So that's going to that's going to depend on local conditions and uh, potentially on the TD's preferences. How do you deal with lag in the internet connection when questions are read? Uh, well, the the short answer to that is uh, we trust people to have. Uh, good internet connections. That if you if you don't have a uh, internet connection that's probably about 2.5 megabits per second up or down, probably online quiz bowl is going to be uh, difficult, but not necessarily unworkable for you. Uh, the question about lag in, or the sort of accompanying question about lag of buzzing in is partly addressed by recommending buzzin.live. We'll talk about that when we uh, get more to that. Um, I don't know if that was a completely satisfactory answer. If you have more technical uh, questions, like what specifically can I do to reduce lag to improve my experience, uh, please take a look at our tournament guide. We have a lot of suggestions there. And if that uh, doesn't satisfy you, email us and we'll, we'll do our best to provide a more thorough answer. 
what brand type model of headphones am I using? Uh, these are a Xiberia, X-I-B-E-R-I-A, GQ, <laughs> J-E-E-C-O-O, uh, V20 set uh, that were recommended to me by my sister. Okay, cleared the question queue, emptied the packet, so to speak. Uh, so that's why we recommend Zoom. Uh, so we just had the question about dealing with uh, lag. Uh, part of the reason we recommend Zoom is it had the fewest problems with lag of the things that we tested. Uh, are players required to consult on bonuses through Zoom or can they have a separate call to allow to differentiate between team discussion and directed answers? Uh, according to the NAQ Tournament Guide, all communication that is part of a game, including intra-team communication like buzzer consult, uh, the bonus consultation goes through Zoom so that it's accessible to the moderator and the other team uh, can hear it, uh, basically to make sure that there's nothing funny going on. Uh, we'll get a little bit later that we did alter our rules a little bit to better differentiate between team discussion and directed answers. All right, uh, if I have a team at school and we are using buzzin.live to play virtually with another school, does each student need a device from which to use buzzin.live even though we were all in the same room? Uh, yes, every student should be logged in separately to buzzin.live, which means a separate device so that the moderator can determine who buzzed first. Uh, if you're playing, I, I guess it, that's if you're playing a format where it matters who buzzed first because only that player can answer. If you're playing a format like uh, Minnesota's Knowledge Bowl where the team as a whole buzzes in, uh, then you would, you would not need that. But in most cases, yes, uh, each player is going to need their own device. That can be a phone. Uh, will Chromebooks work or do you recommend they use their cell phones? Oh, Chromebooks are fine. Uh, the only reason that I would recommend cell phone is that player feedback has been that holding a phone and using it to buzz in has felt, uh, just felt more fun, more like regular quiz bowl. It's more like, broadly speaking, it's more like the handheld devices that you would buzz in with before, but uh, anything will work. Uh, laptop, desktop computer, Chromebook, cell phone, tablet, any of those is fine with buzzin.live. Uh, okay, so why buzzin.live? So when we first started doing this, we thought, well, so the obvious way to buzz in is you just type buzz in Zoom chat. That way you don't need anything else. Uh, it's simple. We tried that and we found it wasn't satisfactory. Most of the time it worked, but there were a lot of times the moderator just didn't see the buzz being registered, uh, the buzz being typed in Zoom chat because they were focused on reading a complicated paragraph from another window. And so they would spill a lot and that caused the other team to protest with no very good resolution. Uh, in particular, Zoom chat doesn't make a noise uh, when it sends a chat message. Uh, so based on that, we thought we need something else. Uh, we chose buzzin.live as uh, being the best in terms of usability versus cost. Uh, we also played a lot of back-to-back -back games with the same players using like Zoom chat, buzzin, and buzzin.live. And there was a very clear majority that said that uh, buzzing in Buzz, uh, buzzin.live felt more natural and was more like traditional quiz bowl. And the third thing is that buzzin.live makes some attempt to correct for network latency issues. That, uh, and Zoom chat, as best I can tell from talking with the people at Zoom, doesn't care. Whatever message gets to the server first, it displays first, which is fine for most business related applications. But for quiz bowl, it's not great. Now, I don't at all want to give the impression that I believe that buzzin.live can magically determine who actually buzzed after hearing the least amount of the question. Uh, it, it can't do that. Networking is too complicated. There's too much randomness in it. But it can monitor the connection, measure your sort of average latency, and make a better estimate of who actually buzzed first. Uh, and so getting a good faith attempt to do that is the third of the reasons that we uh, went with buzzin.live or any of the other buzzer sites. They will all try to do something like this as well. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, this has not been a problem. Uh, prior to doing this, I would have thought, oh, quiz bowlers will protest all the time about who buzzed first. 
uh, that just doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, having played this with lots of people, contentious people, non-contentious people, it feels like it's working correctly and doesn't, doesn't promote lots and lots of protests. Uh, so uh, getting prepared to video conference, what are you going to need? Uh, every player is going to need a webcam. At least according to the online tournament guide, a video feed of every player is required. Uh, so uh, a laptop would work. Uh, if you're doing it on desktop, you probably will need an external webcam. Other devices can be made to work. You'll want to install the Zoom client. Uh, don't use the web client. Uh, installing the Zoom client is going to give better performance. And again, it's one of those things you can do to improve your network and audio issues. You will not need a Zoom account as a coach or a player just to participate in games. The people who will need Zoom accounts specifically are the moderators who are setting up the rooms and the tournament director who is spending money to let them set up rooms. So if you find yourself making an account on Zoom, uh, probably you're not going to need that unless you want to set up your own rooms to run practices, in which case then yes, you would need an account but you still will not need an account just to join a room, join a Zoom meeting to play Quiz Bowl. Uh, so next, uh, headsets like this. I, uh, players really should have headsets. Uh, this is a claim that I've gotten pushback on from a number of people, uh, but ultimately uh, I volunteered to run this webinar, so uh, and it's part of NAQT's online tournament guide, and I feel strongly about it, so I'm going to emphasize it. Uh, having a headset makes the game, having everybody have a headset, makes the game more enjoyable for all concerned. Uh, and by headset, I mean, uh, so this is headset, built-in microphone, headphones, or quality headphones and a good external mic. Not the microphone that's built into your laptop, but an external mic that you purchased as a separate product. Uh, what does this do? They eliminate background noise that's distracting to other players and everybody else in the meeting. They eliminate feedback, uh, which is when sound from your speakers gets picked up by your microphone, which means everybody else hears what they're saying repeated back to them a fraction of a second later, which is really disorienting and obnoxious. Uh, and generally they're more comfortable to wear for long periods of time than other alternatives. Uh, I got a quick question here. Do coaches need a headset also? I would say that this is less important because coaches are not going to be doing uh, a lot of uh, speaking and then not speaking. Coaches, if they have, uh, if they're not using a headset, they can just mute themselves for most of the tournament and do much of their communication with, with their kids by chat room. But uh, a headset, I think, will make the experience better, but I would say it is not as strongly recommended as it is for the players. Uh, the end of the question, I believe you mentioned in the last webinar that students need a downloaded program version of Zoom. For Chromebooks, they would need the app. Uh, yes, that's true. For, for Chromebooks, downloading it is going to be, uh, basically the, the term for that is installing an app on a Chromebook. But specifically, you don't want to use the web version. If it's your only way to play Quiz Bowl, truly your only way to play Quiz Bowl, yes, Quiz Bowl is better than no Quiz Bowl. But as much as possible, you want to use something that you download and install, whether that's an app or a downloadable. Uh, or a downloadable application. Do regular headphones work? Uh, regular headphones are better than nothing, but they are... The main thing is having an open mic that can pick up background noise and has more difficulty doing uh, noise cancellation. Uh, having headphones will probably prevent the feedback issue. So if you just have headphones, that's good, but you may still need to go push to talk uh, to avoid background noise. How do students confer with one another during the directed round? Uh, essentially, they talk into the Zoom meeting uh, as if they were there in person. All right, so uh, getting back to headsets, I don't like to be in a position of saying, hey, you need to spend some, morning, some more money to play Quiz Bowl. Uh, 
we at NAQT try to do that rarely, but in this case, uh, I really think that the benefits are worth it. A quality headset is 20 to $40. You can spend more if you really want to, but you don't have to. You can use it for your other Zoom calls, gaming, host of other applications. If I had to pick one thing that I thought would make the, the biggest difference in improving the online experience, it would be having everybody in the game have a headset. Uh, will players, players mics be on the whole time? We've been practicing with players muted except when answering a question. Well, this, uh, this lie, this uh, feeds into uh, the point about headsets. If you have a headset, you can probably get away with voice activated speech. That is just when you talk, it starts transmitting, which is very natural and less tiring and doesn't uh, lead to issues where you forget to unmute yourself while giving an answer, which uh, probably the moderator will just tell you to unmute yourself and give the answer, but that's just an unnecessary situation. Uh, talking to the Zoom means the other team can hear them conferring. How is that okay? Uh, so I suspect that this is a question about a non-NAQT format. Uh, on NAQT format, bonus parts don't bounce back, so it doesn't really matter what the other team hears. So for the follow-up to that, I guess I need to say that I can't speak authoritatively about how all state formats will work. Uh, that would be something uh, you can take up with us for a more detailed and perhaps uh, put more thought into it answer than I can provide right now. Uh, and also something to get direction from your uh, state activities organization or whoever it is has the rules uh, about bonus conferring. Uh, I, I don't know the exact details of what would be allowed and not allowed or considered traditional or not in every state. Question, how about using Discord? Uh, we tried Discord. We found that its audio quality was significantly worse than Zoom, uh, despite the fact it had a lot of other advantages. And for that reason, we didn't recommend it. Uh, how much does buzzin.live cost for schools? Uh, buzzin.live offers free rooms and premium rooms. A free room supports four players per team or a maximum of eight people in the room. Uh, and that's good enough for many forms of Quiz Bowl. It's not good enough for all formats. I know uh, some certainly have more players than that. A one day key for one room is 99 cents on buzzin.live. So if you want to spring for the premium tournaments, for the premium room, so you can have more than eight people in the room, then uh, it would basically cost a dollar per room. If you're running a 10 team tournament with five rooms, you'd need to buy five keys, which would be $5 for a one day event. Uh, but again, uh, there is a free version, which if you need eight or fewer people in the room may do everything that you need. Uh, will breakout rooms be used for teams to talk to one another? Uh, NQD's tournament guide doesn't recommend that uh, for a variety of reasons. Conceivably a tournament host uh, might end up might end up doing that, but that is not our recommendation. All right, so uh, in addition to having a headset, uh, players and to a lesser degree coaches should be making a point of uh, contributing to the overall all audio quality of the of the game, find a quiet room in which to play. Uh, if you've got any background noises, fans, open windows. That sounds sort of silly to me because it's December here in Minnesota, but uh, take care of the background noises. Ask your family and roommates to be quiet, to not disturb you unless it's an emergency. Uh, ask your family and roommates to minimize their network usage, close down other programs. Video conferencing can be very CPU intensive. So uh, to the degree that you can minimize stuff that computers are doing, that is good. Uh, there's really nothing you have to do for buzzin.live that's going to be free to you as a player or coach. It's just a question of whether the host is going to spend money on it. Use the best computer you have access to. Uh, a desktop or a laptop is going to be better just because it's more powerful. And again, uh, video, uh, video uh, processing video is expensive. Uh, and last, uh, something that 
can be easy to change and can have a huge effect is using an actual wired connection to your router. Uh, I've worked with a number of students here in the Twin Cities that came to me saying, hey, my internet just isn't good enough to play Quiz Bowl, but I want to. And uh, it certainly is the case that your internet connection can be uh, unsuitable for playing Quiz Bowl. But a, a common issue is that your ISP is actually fine, but what's problematic is your local Wi-Fi. And for a lot of these players, just getting a cable and connecting their device directly to the router, directly to their wireless router, uh, worked wonders at improving their speed and their latency. Uh, and this is true even if you need a 60 or an 80 or a 100 foot cable. Uh, if, if you suspect that your internet is actually good, but your Wi-Fi is bad, get an ethernet cable and use that to hook up. It can make an enormous difference. Uh, we got a question here. Do the free rooms include coaches and moderators? The free rooms are limited to eight people in addition to the host. So uh, if you have four players from each team, the coach would not be able to join. The scorekeeper would not be able to join. Uh, I guess uh, that's what happens with the free room. As a tournament director, I have paid premium keys for all of my tournaments. Uh, because I want alternates to be able to be in the room, just so it can be a little bit faster to swap people in and out. Uh, again, tournaments take more time, so do what you can, every little bit to make them faster. And because I want my scorekeepers in the room so they can quickly verify who buzzed first if they missed the moderator announcing it. How do we do substitutions? Uh, for this, uh, my preferred solution and what the guide recommends is all alternates are in the Zoom meeting. Everybody on both teams are in the Zoom meeting and alternates indicate that they're not in the game by adding hyphen ALT to their display name. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But so there's a clear visual indication of who's not in the game currently. Uh, so when you substitute, then it's just a case of one player adds ALT to their name and then stops talking and buzzing in and another player puts, uh, takes the alt out of their name. Uh, but I, this needs, of course, isn't just done completely on the, the player's prerogative. It has to be done in accordance with whatever, the, whatever rules you're playing under. So for NAQT, that would be at halftime, there can be substitutions and the scorekeeper would also be notified so they can uh, keep track of who's in the game for statistical purposes. Uh, but the mechanical effect of how to do substitutions is people just change their names and then act accordingly. Change their display names and act accordingly. So for starting a game, <clears throat> when you join a Zoom meeting, uh, we recommend that all hosts who create meetings uh, enable the waiting room. And the waiting room is basically a, a temporary sort of holding spot that collects people that are trying to join a specific URL. The host will see a notification that people are waiting to join. You can click a button to admit them. Uh, the purpose here is that, so you finish round one, uh, you go to your meeting for round two, that we don't want to have 15 people just spilling into the Zoom meeting for round two, uh, having finished round one. So they collect in the waiting room, and then as soon as round two is done, the moderator admits them all. Uh, so when this happens, you'll see a message like, uh, you are waiting to be admitted. Uh, and in that case, you're in the right place. You just need to wait. And as soon as the game is done, as soon as the whatever game is going on in that room right now is done, the moderator will admit you. Uh, one thing I should mention here, uh, because it's caused a problem at some of my tournaments and is not obvious, is that if you see the different message of waiting on the host to start the meeting, then unless it's the very beginning of the tournament, uh, you're probably in the wrong place and are using the wrong URL. Zoom meetings should exist for the entirety of the tournament and you should never be in a position of it not being started. So maybe things are okay. Maybe the host had to make a immediate meeting change or maybe they're doing things differently. But if you see, if as a player, you log in uh, you or you go to a, a Zoom meeting and you see a message waiting on the host to start the meeting, I would get in touch with your coach or the tournament director and just, uh, just confirm, hey, am I definitely in the right place? Uh, I've got some questions here backing up to buzzin.live. So the host in buzzin.live is the moderator, which is free. Um, 
so yes, the host is the moderator, uh, basically because the moderator has to be there to see who buzzed first. Uh, and the host does not count toward the eight people allowed in a free room. So it would be eight players plus the host. Uh, do students generally know how to change their screen name? Um, I'm going to say yes. Uh, in my experience, students know how to change their screen name in Zoom. Uh, if they, but it, actually mentioning that is later on my list of things to to practice before a tournament is making sure your students know how to change their screen name. Basically, right click on it, enter something new. And moderators should be able. That's something that moderators should also be able to tell them right on the spur of the moment if they get that far without knowing it. Um, all right, so uh, you join the meeting for the game. Then the first thing you should do is set your display name uh, to include either an X or a Y. So this, this is a little bit weird. Takes some getting used to and some trust, I suppose, that it's a good idea. But the most important thing that we've found for moderators to be able to do at a glance is look at a player and know which team they're on because they no longer can see, oh, these people are sitting on the left, <laughs> their opponents are sitting on the right. Uh, they need to know if two players are on the same team or not and whether they're active in the game or not. So the schedule will explicitly label each team that's participating in a game as X or Y. And I mean a literal X or Y. You are team X, you are team Y. When you join the game, uh, set your display name to include that X or Y and your actual name. If you're an alternate, add a hyphen alt to that. So it would be X alt and then your name. So if I were playing a game, I would be X space Robert Hensel. If I was an alternate, X hyphen alt and then Robert Hensel. Uh, when you join the game, one of the first things the moderator will do will give you the buzzin.live code or a URL that takes you directly to the buzzin live room. So the moderator will just say something like buzzin code is 803743 or put it in chat probably to make it easier. So you take that, you just enter it uh, in the buzzin.live site. Uh, and in fact, that is something I can quickly demonstrate here. Uh, here, this, I just went to buzzin.live pretending I'm a player. I would like to join a game. And I know the moderator just told me the game code was 803743. I type that in, type in my nickname, which is what I'm going to be playing under. Uh, which of course is limited in spaces and I join. And this is what I will see as a player. I've got a big old button that I can buzz. Uh, I'm not sharing audio, I don't believe, uh, but there is actually a noise both for you and the moderator when you play it. I happen to have the host's room for that game open here. So you can see that Robert was the button to buzz in first. I clear the buzzers. Back here, I can buzz again. That's all it does. It's a pretty simple website, but uh, it uh, improves the game. And that's really all there is to that. Uh, so, right, so you join a room, then you're gonna get the buzzin.live code from the moderator, open that in a different window or on your phone or a Chromebook, any device should work. Uh, if you need to be pushed to talk, then mute yourself. Uh, and then at this point, uh, I strongly recommend that coaches and players use some sort of chat client to communicate with each other before and <clears throat> during a tournament. You really want to have a way to get in touch with your teammates. Uh, if you can't figure out the URL you're supposed to go to or you don't know what's happening, uh, chat clients are great for that, Discord, Slack, whatever you have. But at this point, you should close or minimize and turn notifications off on that client because you shouldn't be communicating with anybody else uh, while the game is going on. Uh, and also at this point, <clears throat> players need to internalize, they need to minimize talking. That if you're conferring on bonuses, yeah, obviously you're going to talk, but there's a lot of sort of incidental talking that goes on in in-person quiz bowl that uh, people will say, hey, good buzz or great answer or, oh, it's always the Sumerians or something like that. And in person, our ears are fantastic at differentiating that from what the moderator is saying, which is more important. 
Uh, in online Quiz Bowl, it's a lot harder to do that. That voices sound more similar to each other. They're all coming to you from approximately the same spot. And so it is, it's important to minimize the amount of talking because it leads to unnecessary repetition or delays or even problems with the other team hearing their, hearing their question that should be eliminated. Uh, if, generally speaking, chat is not used for anything in a, uh, once a game has started, uh, in extraordinary circumstances, it might be necessary to send a chat, but all chat messages should be sent to everybody, just so in particular your opponents can see the communication that's going on just the way that they'd be able to hear it uh, if you were, were raising an issue or trying to resolve an issue during an in-person match. Uh, I have a question here. So the, the X is in brackets in your team name. Yes, left bracket, X, right bracket, and then your name. All right, rules changes. So this part is ultra specific to playing NAQT format games. But uh, these roots, rule changes are all made to address specific issues that came up during testing. And uh, so we would expect, uh, I would expect that uh, people playing under different rule sets that are promulgated by activities associations would have conceptually similar changes or at least attempts made to address the same issues. So make sure you're familiar with any online rules that uh, have been published to see what their recommendations are. Uh, the first, this surprised a lot of people that NAQT's recommendation for online tournaments is untimed games. Uh, that doesn't reflect a changed philosophical position at NAQT about timed versus untimed, but the very practical one that there's already a lot of new things that have been thrown into the mix uh, Zoom, buzzin.live, electronic score sheets, online question system, uh, different devices. And we, we weighed the benefits of adding yet something else to enforce a timer. And we thought it wasn't worth it. So if you're playing NQT Quiz Bowl by our recommendations, a game is 20 toss up bonus cycles. Uh, second uh, is that when you're giving a bonus answer, if you're directing an answer to the moderator, you precede it by saying, our answer is. Uh, and uh, this seems like a really simple thing that maybe I should just mention and move on. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize its importance that we had a huge problem in our testing games with differentiating bonus conferral from an answer being directed to the moderator, uh, especially as time was running out. Uh, so we introduced this, uh, you say our answer is, and it dramatically cleared things up. Uh, I think this is an important thing to practice for online games. So your players are familiar with it and remember it. Uh, and don't force the, the moderator into making a judgment call about, well, was that directed to me and in time or was it not directed to me? Uh, and therefore maybe I need to, to call time on them. Uh, if a player drops uh, during the game, or and by drop, I mean that relatively loosely to have any sort of technical issues that just preclude them from playing, like they're, they're just absolutely inaudible or, or, or they just disappear from the meeting entirely, then what happens is the moderator will finish the toss at bonus cycle and then we'll wait for a minute to allow that player to rejoin. If the player can rejoin, then great, you continue on. Uh, if the player can't, then there's a free substitution period. This doesn't take a timeout or anything where both teams can put different players in. If that player, player later shows up, uh, then they can automatically rejoin at the end of a toss up bonus cycle. But so if this is you as a player and you're uh, working hard to get back into the game, you should expect that when you rejoin the game, you will be not be an active player until the next toss up bonus cycle, but you could rejoin then uh, without taking a toss up if your team is playing shorthanded. Uh, the moderator will do will provide that minute long period twice for the same player who drops. If you drop a third time, the moderator will allow substitutions, but then just continue. Uh, extra time is allowed after the prompt on a bonus question. Uh, NAQT's traditional rules are the bonus part is read, then after four and a half-ish seconds, the moderator prompts you, so you have a five seconds to think, 
The captain gives the answer effectively immediately. Under the online rules, uh, there are three seconds after the prompt, so a total of eight seconds if you max both of these periods out, for a player to begin saying, our answer is. Uh, this, this was the best solution we found to the fact that conferring uh, was just more difficult to do, uh, not in terms of the time pressures, but just for the moderators to sort out when everyone had exactly finished speaking. Uh, Rereading bonus parts. As a team, once per game, you can ask a moderator to reread a bonus part or sort of any sort of, uh, any sort of question that was directed only to your team. So not a toss up. Uh, and the first time you make that request during a game, the moderator will reread it um, no matter what. You can make subsequent requests for that and it's at the moderator's discretion. So the purpose of this is a couple of times a game, if there's an audio issue or some problem, a bonus part gets reread, and that's just in the name of a, you know a workable, workable tournament that overcomes momentary glitches in the networking technology. Uh, but it should not be, it certainly shouldn't be invoked on every question or even every second or every third question. A moderator is going to start denying that if your connection is truly not good enough to consistently hear. Uh, what's being read, then uh, that needs to be, uh, you need to look into the, the technical problems for that. Uh, we have a question here, uh, going back to alternates. Alternates are in the active Zoom session at the same time as the players, correct? Yes, everyone was in there. Uh, we felt it was important to let everyone sort of see and experience the game. They would if they were sitting in the same room to to keep them interested, especially for players who aren't going to play all that often, they should at least be able to uh, experience the game. They can be substituted in as needed, yes, as needed and in accordance with the rules. And the player who is no longer playing should change their name to read, yeah, bracket X hyphen alt bracket and then their name. But yes, alternates are not being brought in from outside the Zoom meeting. They should be there ready to take part and also able to uh, enjoy the game and learn things from the questions. Rereading toss-ups. There is, there is a very different rule for whether toss-ups can be reread, and it's uh, much more narrow. And that is if the moderator has real objective reason to think that the toss-up wasn't heard by all of the players, such as uh, the moderator left himself on mute or the network, the moderator's network uh, connection crashed, or there was some huge amount of background noise or something that if the moderator can identify something like that that says this toss-up was probably not heard by anybody, the moderator can reread it. But a, a toss-up cannot be reread uh, just based on one or more players saying, I wasn't able to hear that toss-up. In that case, it just is played, maybe it goes dead, but uh, that's the end of that toss-up. Uh, are spectators allowed in the Zoom meetings? Uh, according to the NQT tournament guide, yes, spectators need video feeds, so it can be verified that they basically are who they say they are, uh, and they should be muted, and they should not communicate with players during gameplay. Uh, but otherwise, spectators are welcome. We think it's fantastic that uh, people will be able to see their, their friends and their kids and uh, grandkids uh, compete in this game. So this was really sort of implicitly true, but not in the explicit part of the rules prior to this, but players should not be communicating with the outside world during a game. Uh, all the communication they should have is with other players in the game, either on their team or the opponent or with the moderator. The exception to this would be during some sort of communication breakdown that possibly a player that has had technical problems and can't get into the game would communicate with a teammate during, while gameplay is stopped to sort of uh, give an indication of their status. But broadly speaking, you should not be chatting or using any other sort of communication with people who are not in the game during gameplay. Uh, finally, protests on network issues. Uh, essentially, you can't. Uh, at least according to NAQT, technical problems are an unprotestable part. The moderator may make rulings on how to address them in the way that seems fairest. Uh, and those are uh, those are by and large unprotestable. 
All right, a couple of things for a better tournament experience that historically the host had a lot of control over the, the tournament environment, where it was played and the rooms that were used. And just uh, the act of traveling to a tournament and being at a different school or a different college provided a lot of social signals about how to behave at a tournament that encouraged focus on the game. A lot of those disappear with an online tournament, especially if players are playing from home. You're now around a lot of familiar things. You're around a lot of possessions. You're around people who normally would be free to talk to you. You're around your computer. You have access to the majesty of the internet right there. Uh, there's a lot of temptations there that uh, as players, you should uh, overcome really to focus on the game, uh, take it as seriously as everyone else should be treating it and make it a good experience. So in particular, <clears throat> uh, be early. If the first game is at 4 p.m., be online with all of your equipment tested and working at 3.50. If you have questions, get them answered in advance. If you have equipment, test it in advance. Uh, whatever software you're using, see if updates are required in advance. Uh, if you're using stuff that is battery powered, charge it in advance. Uh, don't make any plans to multitask during the tournament. Yes, you're at home and in theory could do other things, um, but unless the tournament has a really well-defined and well-timed you know, set of buys when you're free, you should plan on, I'm going to be at this tournament. Uh, this shows my you know, dedication to my and my teammates' goals of doing well and playing as a team to focus on the tournament. Uh, set up a communication system in advance. Uh, figure out what you're going to do if your internet fails in advance. Um, before the tournament, do a practice run with sample questions, just so you have a feeling for how the our answer is rule works and what it's like to buzz in with uh, buzzin.live. If you have to be on push.talk, practice that to minimize the chance that you're giving your answer while muted. Uh, in particular, when you join any sort of practice preliminary session, uh, ask the other players, your other teammates, uh, do they hear feedback from you? Do they hear background noise from you? Uh, that those are things that oftentimes you just won't detect as a player, but can be really off-putting, especially multiplied by four or eight uh, to the other people. And going to a tournament, know how to find your next game. Uh, so where the schedule is, how it works. Uh, continuing in the same vein, I guess, know how to contact your teammates, know how to contact your coach, know how to contact the TD. And then if something does happen to your internet, if you get dropped from a game, uh, contact everyone proactively and let them know your status. If you're, if you're disappearing, let them know that. Otherwise, most tournament directors are going to try to be, to be fair and accommodating and understand that issues happen and they will delay a game to, to try to get you back in, especially if it's in a playoff game. Uh, but if, if you know that you have to leave either because of an emergency or technical problems, uh, let your coach, let the TD know that so they can, uh, so they don't wait around for you. Uh, if you're the coach, make sure the TD has good contact information for you, including a phone number. Uh, probably this happens during tournament registration, but on the off chance it doesn't, I would proactively uh, contact the TD and say, hey, I'm the coach for such and such a team. If you need to contact me during the tournament, please do it this way. That This will be get the, the quickest response. Also as a coach before the tournament, reach out and definitively confirm that your players are present, they're online and they are ready to play and confirm that to the TD. So that uh, so if the TD provided a formal check-in procedure, then obviously you should follow that, uh, help them run things the way they want them to be run. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I would proactively, even if the TD didn't ask for it, email the TD and say, hey, I'm the coach for, for uh, Central High School. My A and B teams are ready. We're looking forward to the tournament. See you in a few minutes. All right, if you're a coach, what should you ask for in advance? Well, you should absolutely not assume that every tournament is going to use this guide. Whatever we may say, tournaments are free to do whatever they want, and they may be required to do other things. They may choose to do other things. Uh, so you should check with them probably at least a week in advance to know the specifics about how the tournament is going to run. 
uh, not just like what time does it start, but uh, what video conferencing platform are you using? What are the requirements there? Are players required to have video feeds? Are there other requirements about video? Make sure you have all that, distribute it to your players so they can uh, install and practice with it. Uh, make sure you have contact information for use during the tournament. Uh, something specific to online tournaments is find out the time zone of the tournament you're going to. Uh, it's been, there have been a fairly constant stream of reports to NAQT about uh, teams joining tournaments in other parts of the country, which is great. That's fantastic. It's one of the few benefits the pandemic has brought to Quiz Bowl is the ability to play people all over the world even. Uh, but uh, you should know the time zone the tournament is being administered from so that if the tournament director says, <clears throat> hey, uh, be back from lunch at one, you know what exactly that means. Ultimately, it's your responsibility to be in the, in the right place at the right time. Uh, definitely ask whether you'll be staffing or not. Uh, it's rude, but it's one thing to hand a packet to a coach when they arrive at an in-person tournament and ask them to read when it's something they've been doing for you know, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. Uh, but if, uh, if you might be asked to staff an online tournament, there are new skills and new things you'll be doing and you'd want to understand definitively from the TD whether that's an expectation of you as a coach or not. Look at the schedule that the TD gives you. And I mentioned this earlier, look for places where you definitely have to get information from the TD. Are there tiebreaker rounds here? How will I know? Is there a play bracket, playoff bracket here? How do I get it? And maybe the answer really is simple. And that's, that's great. Good communication makes a lot of these things simple. Maybe the answer is, Look at this web page; it will be posted there. Great, but then know that you need to go check that web page at the appropriate time, and uh, make sure that you are doing that. Uh, and also pass any relevant information along to your players, uh, maybe even quizzing them on it. Uh, tell me the URL for your first game. I have a lot of players show up at my tournaments. I run an open Zoom meeting before the tournament for people to ask questions, and there are a huge number of players there that I get to the point that uh, I say, okay, you can head out to your first round game and a huge number of players are like, oh, I don't know how to do that. So uh, this is something that generally is, certainly should be communicated in advance. Uh, navigating room to room is a, a big part of the online experience. Pass that along to your players, make sure they're familiar with it. Uh, I had a little bit here about spectators, but that was preempted by a question. So again, spectators, it's fine. They should have a video feed. They should be muted. Uh, next quick section, sadly, uh, is cheating. I had previously thought that that didn't make the cut of being important enough to spend everybody's time on with this. Uh, but uh, the tournaments that were run yesterday resulted in three separate reports of cheating or probable cheating to NAQT. Uh, and that made me reverse my decision. So very quickly, I wanted to point out that preventing cheating is one of the two primary reasons that video feeds are required by many tournaments and certainly required by the NAQT tournament guide. Uh, in addition, as a player, uh, you shouldn't have other windows open. You shouldn't be typing during a game. That is considered very suspicious. It looks for all the world like I've got Google open and I'm Googling these clues. So there are certainly innocuous things you could be doing that would not provide a benefit in Quiz Bowl, but in terms of focusing on the game and not looking suspicious, close all your other windows. Don't be typing in chat. Don't be typing in anything during the game. Some tournaments might have a policy of playing with one hand visible. That is, you know, playing perhaps like this or holding it like this. Uh, uh, if it wasn't clear, the purpose of those is to make it more difficult to type or use a different device during a game to communicate. Uh, you shouldn't take it as any sort of uh, insult if that's part of the rules for a tournament. It's, uh, it's relatively common. Uh, I think it is becoming more common uh, and it's, uh, the benefit of participating in a tournament where you really have confidence that everything is being done properly and no one is playing with an, with an extra advantage 
uh, outweighs the the inconvenience of playing with a hand. My personal preference is to play like this. I find it less tiring and has an appropriate thinker-like prose pose that's uh, uh, good for Quizbowl. But uh, you can really do anything you want that works there. Um, so I got a lot of questions about how to run online practices. And I relegated that to the end because, uh, unfortunately, I don't have any magical wisdom there. I have some pretty pretty simplistic things to say, which is uh, practicing under your under tournament conditions helps a lot. You don't have to do that for all your practices, but if you're preparing for a tournament, especially if it's doing things differently, do run a practice using their preferred video conferencing software. If they're not using buzzing.live, use whatever buzzer site they're using. If they're buzzing on Zoom chat, buzz on Zoom chat for a practice. Get your players familiar with it. If you're a player, familiarize yourself with it. Uh, practice just the basic bits of Zoom functionality. Uh, know how to mute and unmute yourself. Know how to change your audio volume. Uh, know how to go push to talk or not. Uh, oh, and lastly, uh, some coaches have told us that they don't have material to practice on because all of their NA NAQT archives or all of their question archives in general are at their school. Uh, one thing that NAQT introduced last year is that we provided electronic distribution of questions via Lock Lizard, which is uh, essentially encrypted PDFs. So you can get you can sign up for a Lock Lizard account in NAQT and get online web access or downloadable access for uh, all of the packets in your archive. Every tournament your school has played, every practice question you've bought, it should be in there available online and you would be able to use that during practices with your teams. Uh, you can even uh, set your players up with accounts to share that material so they could practice on their own. Uh, there's no charge for that. Obviously all of the original packets that got them in there in the first place involved either buying practice questions or attending a tournament, but just getting and using the online access um, is free. Okay, I have uh, once again run over uh, the amount of time. I've got a few questions that have accumulated here that I'm going to run through. After that, I'll stick around for more questions that people have. But uh, at this point, I wanted to thank all of you for choosing to spend your time this way. If you're a player for your enthusiasm for Quiz Bowl and your desire to, to have a good experience and be a good teammate and a good attendee. Uh, if you're a coach for uh, helping to bring your team together and doing things differently than maybe you signed up for in a previous year. Uh, and if you're a staffer or a, a tournament host or a representat uh, representative of uh, an activities association who is watching this one as well. Uh, I hope that we've presented a little bit about what, what players will be expecting and what their concerns might be going in. Oh, we have a question jumping back here about Lock Lizard. How do we request access for Lock Lizard for our players? Uh, email NAQT. Uh, the precise address is edist, like an abbreviation of e-distribution, e-d-i-s-t at naqt.com. Basically just provide their email addresses and we'll authorize them. And then once they've made an account, they will be able to access the packets. Uh, what should coaches do during games? 90% uh, of the answer here is coaches should do what they were doing before. Uh, the larger emphasis would be on, I think there's more to do in terms of advanced communication with your teams. You can't count on giving them an information dump on the drive over to the tournament or having everyone gathered around for 30 minutes to listen to you prior to the tournament. Uh, you need to uh, let them know more about what's going on with the tournament and what to expect. But actually during the tournament, as a coach, uh, sign into the rooms, especially the rooms with your less experienced teams, Watch them, look for things they're doing oddly, watch for holes in their knowledge that you need to focus on at practice. But basically the same sort of stuff that you were doing before. Uh, I, I suppose I should also point out state rules might have very specific provisions about what coaches do or don't do. So uh, nothing that I say here can, can counteract that. Uh, what do coaches do to best prepare their players for an online tournament? I would say practice under equivalent technical conditions. If the tournament is being run on Zoom, practice on Zoom. If it's being run on Discord, run a practice on Discord. Uh, find the rules that are being used, 
find the closest questions you can to those that are being used at the event and practice on those. Um, make sure players uh, understand uh, how they should be joining meetings, how they should determine which Zoom meeting or whatever it is they need to join. Make sure they understand how late the tournament might go. Uh, if you suspect the tournament is going to run late due to optimistic scheduling, make sure the players know that so that they don't schedule extra things in their lives that conflict. Oh, this is interesting. What happens between games at an online tournament? I don't know if there's a definitive answer to that. My guess is that at most online tournaments you go to, there's not supposed to be time between games. That you finish a game, you should move on to the next one, and as soon as it's ready to start, it will start, and there's no entertainment provided in between. That you should uh, chat with your teammates between games with your Zoom window open waiting to be admitted. Uh, it is certainly possible that an online tournament might decide that it wanted to provide uh, especially if it had scheduled buys, I guess, that it might want to provide some other activity in those times. But I, I'm not sure exactly what that would be or, or what to expect. So I would say between games, uh, chat with your teammates, read a book, listen to music, but keep an eye on the Zoom meeting so that when it's ready to go, you are ready to go. Well, what can players do to minimize suspicions that they are cheating? Uh, Provide a video feed. Make sure the video feed shows your face and the surrounding area behind you. Focus on the screen and the camera. Don't always be looking sort of off at other things. If you have distracting things in your room that you might want to look at, cover them or move them. Don't look at other windows. Don't type. Uh, don't communicate with other people. And this is during gameplay primarily. In between games, Yes, it's okay and important to chat to communicate with your your teammates and your coach and find out what's going on and stay, you know, benefit from the social aspects of Quiz Bowl. But when the game is going, don't have other windows open, don't type, don't communicate with other people, uh, and uh, keeping one hand in the video. And the last question I got, uh, for which I also don't have a good answer, is: Are there opportunities to do exciting new things with online practice as opposed to in-person practice? Uh, I wish I had a brilliant answer here that I could say, hey, practices will be twice as fun in the online realm if you do such and such. Uh, I don't have anything like that. Uh, hopefully quiz bowl <clears throat> and uh, the chance to interact with other quiz bowlers is enough of a draw. But since I felt like I should say something about this, uh, I thought I'd pass along a novel way of practice, practicing that has nothing to do with being online. That was taught to me by my quiz bowl mentor, Eric Hilleman. Uh, which he never named, so I will name Buzz a Friend, uh, where you play as teams, and when you buzz in on a toss-up, uh, instead of answering, you pick another player on your team who has to give the answer at that point. Uh, I found this to be a great deal of fun and an interesting way to uh, enjoy practice differently because it really relies on knowing and thinking about what your teammates know as opposed to what you know and really gauging how long you wanted to wait to buzz in. Are games video recorded to look back at in case of cheating allegations? Uh, the answer is, <clears throat> the answer for the online tournament guide is no. That we looked at things and thought that there were uh, enough issues involved in recording minors that it was not viable to record games. Uh, and there are also question security issues involved in there being recordings of games. That answer may or may not be true for tournaments, uh, for state activities association tournaments uh, or other non-NAQT events. So that would also be something to ask the tournament director about. And if you have concerns, either because you want them to be recorded or you don't want them to be recorded, uh, you would need to clarify that. Okay, uh, uh, we'd also like your, uh, your feedback on this on this webinar and of course on the tournament guide in general. If you've experienced online tournaments, we want to hear from players and coaches to get a better understanding of how things are working, what's not working. We expect to revise our guidelines moving forward as we uh, work to make uh, Quiz Bowl just as great of an experience as it can be uh, under the current conditions. So 
Thank you again for attending, and we hope to see you at NAQT events and any other Quiz Bowl events uh, throughout the country.